everyone, Robin from Backscatter here, and today we're going to cover how to take great macro photos with the Olympus EPL-10. We made this guide for underwater photographers who want not only the best macro image quality, but also the easiest shooting experience underwater. The key thing to remember is that macro shooting with manual settings is actually way easier than you might think, so don't be intimidated. We're going to get the camera preset so that the only things that you need to adjust underwater are focus and flash power. This is going to make your shooting experience as simple as possible while also producing excellent image results. After seeing how easy it is to shoot in manual, you're never going to go back to an auto mode again. Now I'll put up a little camera nerd alert when we go a little deep into the need to know details behind any of the given settings. We've separated our easy custom settings into two categories, on the boat and in the water. On the boat settings are the kinds of things that we're going to set once and then just forget about, while in the water are the types of settings and techniques that we will need to work with during our dive. All of the info in this video is available on a downloadable cheat sheet in the companion article to this video on Backscatter.com. You can find a link to that in the video description. When we say macro, we're talking about subjects that are about fist sized and smaller. Our primary goal is to make these small subjects stand out from their surroundings with a clean, dark background and sharp focus on their defining features, which is most often the eyes. The key to achieving this goal is to knock out all of the natural light in our shot, so we have to make our exposure for that natural light really dark. The end result will be that the only light that we see is from our strobe flash, which is going to create that rich pop of color and more contrast between our subject and its surroundings. We're going to achieve these goals by shooting in manual mode. We'll teach you everything you need to know in order to shoot in manual with confidence. It's actually quite easy, because we can really just break everything down into two categories, exposure and focus. So what's exposure? Exposure is basically just how bright or dark your image is. There's only four factors that determine exposure. Aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and flash power. The really cool thing here is that we're going to preset three of those four settings, so the only exposure factor we actually have to do anything with underwater is our flash power. Judging and evaluating for the correct exposure while shooting in manual mode is actually really easy too, and we're going to cover how to do that in the easiest way possible using built-in features of the EPL-10. Focus is the greatest challenge of shooting macro. We're going to be dealing with a depth of field that is very thin, so there's only going to be a very narrow band of our image that's actually in focus. Just moving the camera mere fractions of an inch can put your key detail area in or out of focus, so we have to be very aware of our camera movement. We're going to set the camera up using intelligent, continuous autofocus tracking. This means you can just point the center of the frame at what you want in focus, hold down that focus button, and then just steadily recompose the shot exactly how you want it. There's a few pieces of essential gear that you're going to need to pull off great macro shots, and there's also some optional gear that'll make things a little easier and more versatile. The EPL-10 needs a macro lens, and that can be a diopter paired with the 14-42mm kit lens, or you can use the Olympus 60mm macro lens, which can also optionally be paired with a diopter too for even more extreme super macro levels of magnification. Diopters can simply be threaded onto the port, but an optional flip holder makes it a lot easier to just quickly flip that diopter on and off, or swap between different powers with multiple flip holders. You'll also need a tray with at least one handle to mount your single strobe, and optionally a snoot to taper down that strobe beam. We also like to take advantage of expanded viewfinders, but these aren't a necessity. 
The biggest gear choice to make is your lens setup, since this is gonna have the most impact on what size of subject you can shoot and how close or how far you're gonna have to get to it. There are two different lens configurations that we recommend for shooting macro with the EPL-10. There's the 14 to 42 millimeter easy lens with a diopter, and there's the 60 millimeter Olympus macro lens that can also optionally be used with a diopter. This brings us to our first nerd alert. Let's do a comparison of these two lens configurations and figure out why you would choose one over the other. The 14 to 42 millimeter kit lens is good on its own for shooting medium sized fish portraits, but it's just really not tight enough to shoot true small sized macro subjects. This is why we must add a macro diopter, such as the AOI UCL05. A diopter shifts the lens's entire focus range closer, allowing us to get closer to small subjects so that we can fill more of the frame with them. The key benefit of the 14 to 42 lens is its zoom range, which provides a pretty decent range of flexibility to shoot different size subjects. You can't fully zoom the lens out without getting some vignetting effect, but even so, you're able to balance between your zoom level and a decent working distance to capture plenty of different subject sizes. This is ultimately the least expensive way to shoot macro because you can just use the camera's included lens and the stock port for the housing. The diopter is really the only additional piece of gear you have to get. The trade-off of this setup is that because the entire focus range shifts, we do become locked into both a minimum and a maximum focus range, limiting both how close and how far away we can be from our subject while still being able to focus. The Olympus 60mm macro lens is specifically built for macro and doesn't need to rely on any accessory lens, creating a less restrictive focus range. There is still a limit to how close you'll be able to get, but you won't be restricted to how far you can back up and still achieve focus, which creates a wider range of subject sizes that you can capture without having to change anything. The 60 mm lens also autofocuses faster than the 14 to 42 with the diopter setup as well, which makes the overall shooting experience that much better. You can, of course, add a diopter onto the 60 mm lens as well to create super macro levels of extreme magnification for the tiniest of tiny critters. Really, the only downside to using the 60 mm lens is that it requires either an extension ring to work with the included port, or you have to use just a separate dedicated port. Of course, the lens itself has to be purchased too, so it is a little bit more gear to acquire. No matter which lens setup you go with, the use of a flip holder for the diopter is really key. It's awesome to have that option to just quickly flip it on or off to be able to accommodate different sizes of subject. Not gonna lie, it's pretty luxurious to use it. We like using a single compact body strobe for most macro. Shooting with a single strobe makes it easy to just create shadows right where you want them, whereas using two strobes will eliminate most shadows. Most macro shots are done with only one strobe, and most strobes are going to provide more than enough light to meet our macro goals. A strobe with a compact body makes it a lot easier to work into tight spots, so leave your big strobes behind for shooting wide angle stuff. This is also why we recommend the Backscatter Mini Flash. It's really compact and it's more than bright enough to reach our ideal exposure settings. The bright built-in target light makes it easy to find your subject and get focus on them and to see exactly what your flash beam is gonna do when it fires. While not necessarily essential, one of the best things you can add to your macro rig is a snoot. Use the optical snoot with the mini flash to taper down the beam angle to a pinpoint to truly isolate your subject and create much more dramatic lighting. Expanded viewfinders may also not be essential for everyone, but they do have some benefits that are hard to live without once getting used to them. 
Angled viewfinders like the UMG05 make it easy to get down low on an even level with the subject without straining to see your screen by burying your face down in the sand. Magnifying viewfinders like the UMG01 make it easier to get a large, sharp view of the LCD screen and to give you even more detail to look at when you're checking your shots for critical focus. We're going to go through all of the menu settings first because they're truly just set and forget. Then we're going to cover all of the exposure settings and then our focus settings. Start off by performing a full reset of the camera to restore all of the default settings and to make it easier to follow along in this video. Go to the main menu, shooting menu 1, reset, full, and then confirm. You can hit the info button at any time in the main menu to toggle the little pop-up tips on or off. Next, head down to the custom menu with the little gear icon. Then go to page C1 and bring up the playback info settings. Select playback info and then turn on highlight and shadows. This is going to give us a helpful tool to judge our exposure, which we'll cover during our in the water settings. While still on page C1 in the custom menu, turn on Live View Boost. Live View Boost brightens the on-screen preview image so that we can more easily see what we're working with and be able to better compose our shots. Then while still in the custom menu, head down to page F and change the color space to Adobe RGB. This will capture images in a wider color gamut than sRGB for more latitude to work with during editing. Scroll down from the custom menu to the setup menu and then over to rec view. This setting controls how long your image is displayed on the LCD screen for review right after you shoot it. The default setting is only half a second, which is pretty annoying because it's really not long enough to check for any meaningful detail. If you're a novice shooter, you'll probably want to boost this up to at least two seconds, since that's a pretty good balance point between getting a good look and not having the image up too long. If you're feeling like a little bit more of a camera nerd, then we've got a settings hack that'll actually allow for faster shooting. Our recommended method is to simply set the rec view to off and then instead just hit the playback button on the camera when you want to bring up your shots for review. There's really nothing more annoying in the moment when you're trying to capture some split second action and every shot results in a screen taking over pop up which requires you to half press to cancel and get it out of there. You're going to end up with a lot more shots to choose from if you can just fire away without interruption and then review them at will. After choosing whichever setting best matches your shooting style, back out of the main menu and then head back to the main shooting screen. Hit the OK button to bring up the on-screen quick menu. Select white balance and just make sure that that is set to auto. We'll be close enough to our subjects and we'll have enough light from our strobe that we won't need to worry at all about compensating for any color loss. The next setting is image quality, which is set to large, fine JPEG by default. JPEGs are compressed image files and they can't really be edited very much without sacrificing detail and quality, while raw photos are uncompressed and can be edited extensively without losing quality. Now here's a quick nerd alert. You have to use some software like Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop or something similar to work with raw files. They won't just be ready to publish right away like a JPEG is. We highly recommend using Adobe Lightroom to import, organize, and develop your photos and to just shoot exclusively in raw. It's really the way to do it. Shooting in only JPEG is really limiting for any sort of creative development and shooting in both RAW and JPEG really just ends up eating up your memory card space and cluttering up your long-term storage. If you're already used to developing RAW photos, then of course just set the image quality option to RAW only. If you don't plan to work with RAW photos or to really do any extensive editing, then just set the option to the 
best quality, super fine, large JPEG. So that does it for all of the set once and forget details in the menus. Now let's get into exposure. The first thing we need to do is put the camera into manual mode so that we can adjust all of our exposure settings. Rotate the mode dial to M for manual. Now we can preset three of the four factors that determine our exposure, the ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, leaving us with only the flash power to manage in the water. So let's set our ISO first. Bring up the quick menu again, select ISO, and then change it from auto to 200. ISO controls how sensitive the camera's sensor is to light, so increasing the ISO value will make the scene brighter, but it's also gonna create more digital noise and graininess in the shot, and since our goal is to eliminate all of that natural light and to preserve the best image quality, we wanna keep ISO set to the lowest, darkest full value at 200. Next, we'll set our aperture, which is also known as the f-stop. Hit up or the little plus minus button on the directional pad, and then use the right button to walk your aperture over to its highest setting of f22. The higher the f-stop number, or the higher the aperture value, the smaller the hole becomes on the lens to collect light. So increasing that f-stop, getting it to the highest number, is gonna make the smallest hole, which will also make the scene darker, and it's gonna create more of an in-focus area of our depth of field. So this is gonna help us eliminate more natural light by being darker, and it's gonna ensure that more of our critical area is captured in sharp focus. To set the shutter speed, press up on the directional pad and set the shutter speed to 1 250th of a second. As we increase or make the shutter speed faster, we're limiting how much light makes it through to the sensor, creating, you guessed it, less natural light and a darker background. 1 250th of a second is the fastest that we can actually set the shutter while still also being able to synchronize with our strobe flash so we can really just leave it at that limit. Now we've got three of those four exposure factors preset and we really never have to change them. We're locked in for the darkest exposure to eliminate as much natural light as possible while also still being able to sync with our strobes while getting as much of our subject in focus as possible with the least amount of noise and graininess. All of this leaves us free to concentrate solely on strobe power during the dive. That's all we can do for our exposure pre-dive, so now let's get our focus settings taken care of. When shooting macro, focus is absolutely critical. No matter what lens setup we're working with, our depth of field is gonna be extremely thin, like ranging from a few millimeters to razor thin, depending on our specific optics. Fortunately for us EPL-10 shooters, the camera's continuous autofocus tracking feature works really well. To activate this focus tracking, just bring up the quick menu, select the focus modes, and then scroll all the way over to continuous autofocus tracking. Then hit left on the directional pad to bring up the autofocus area selector and then hit info to toggle the controls. Use left or right to turn face detection off and then press up or down to set the autofocus area to just a single point in the dead center of the frame. Now we can simply aim at what we want in focus in the center of the frame. Remember, this is typically gonna be the eye or the most prominent foreground feature of our subject. And then we can autofocus and lock onto that and the camera will track and update focus as we recompose the shot just how we want it. The default setting for just about every camera out there is to have a half press of the shutter button activate the autofocus. Now it can be a challenge to steadily hold a half press of the shutter button when you're dealing with a paddle style control on an underwater housing. 
It's kind of hard to feel that little half press stop sometimes, and you'll probably accidentally snap more than a few pictures before you are ready. When autofocus is controlled with the shutter button, you must reacquire focus with every shot. Starting from scratch every time can be a challenge when both you and the subject are moving and you're dealing with not only a super thin depth of field, but you're also possibly just trying to keep the subject in the frame. Fortunately, we've got a setting that will easily overcome this challenge. Most experienced underwater photographers, aka camera nerds, prefer to actually assign the focus function to a thumb activated button on the back of the housing. This technique is commonly called back button autofocus. Back button autofocus gives you the option to simply use your thumb to activate and hold focus while it tracks, leaving your index finger free to just simply snap the frame. The key benefit of separating focus away from the shutter button is that the camera will no longer attempt to refocus with every half press of the shutter button. The only thing the shutter button does is just take the picture. This will allow you to shoot faster and with greater control, so it's really the way to go. So depending on your personal preference, you may choose to just leave focus set to the half press method, but if you do want to set up that back button autofocus, here's how we do it. Bring up the main menu, head down to the gear icon custom menu, page A and select AEL AFL, then CAF and set it to mode 3. This is the setting that actually takes autofocus away from the shutter and moves it to the AEL AFL button. So now let's set up that AEL AFL button to be at our thumb. Go down to page B in the menu, select button function, FN function, and set that to AEL AFL. Now our custom assignable function button is right next to our thumb rest, and this is what's gonna activate that autofocus. We are now as fully preset for success as we can be for any given macro dive. Now we wanna load the camera in the housing, Make sure you have the zoom gear on if you're using that 14 to 42 lens. And then make sure that your hot shoe is connected for the LED flash trigger and that that unit is turned on. Also, make sure you draw a vacuum to guarantee that everything is sealed up nice and tight. Now we can finally cover what we need to know in the water. After getting in and making sure that you're all good, go ahead and get in the macro mindset. Now we're on a critter hunt, and if we find something really cool, it's okay to spend a fair portion, or all, of our dive in just that one spot trying to work it the best we can. Once we find our macro subject, the first thing to do is line up the approach. Your lens setup and the size of the subject are gonna determine how close or how far away you need to be and what you'll be able to focus on. Fire up your target light to illuminate the scene and to provide some assistance to the camera to be able to autofocus quickly. From here, it's all about filling the frame with your subject and getting as close as we need to in order to do so. If the subject is really small, or if you're getting really close to it, then we might bump up against our minimum focus distance and the camera will no longer be able to achieve focus. If that's the case, just simply back up a bit and keep attempting to focus until it's able to. That's when you've reached your minimum focus distance. Remember, if you're using a diopter, then it's also gonna limit how far back you can back up while still being able to focus. So if you have to back up farther than it's able to focus in order to fit the subject in the frame, just take that diopter off. We're always gonna aim to focus for the eye of the subject or whatever the closest defining element in the frame is. 
Not every subject has an eye, and not every shot must be an eye shot. Sometimes a protruding snout or a nudie's rhinophore is the key focus point, so you do have to use your judgment based on the subject, but in general, just aim for the closest standout element or the key feature. Activate your autofocus tracking and hold it on that key feature as you move to recompose the shot without too drastically changing distance. You can judge your focus and make sure that it's sharp by taking a test shot and then hitting the playback button to bring up your image and then zoom in and just take a good look at those critical areas. Since we preset everything else, the only other thing left to manage for our exposure is our flash. Bring your strobe out over the front of your rig, kind of like an anglerfish lure, angled down and forward, and then just aim it at your subject. We like this position because we can easily create that natural overhead lighting look while preserving contrast and shadow underneath the subject. If your subject is closer to your lens, bring your strobe down closer too. If the subject is further away, just push your strobe further away too. With the MF1, if the target light is hitting your subject, then your flash will hit your subject. Our recommended jump setting is to set your strobe to full power. Take a test shot at full power and hit the playback button to bring it back up on screen. The highlight warnings that we activated in the menu earlier are gonna give us a big blinking alert on areas that are starting to get blown out and overexposed. Taking one test shot at a time, just decrease your strobe power until you're only getting little teeny bits of blinking or you're happy with the overall level of contrast in the shot. A few highlights are fine and actually exactly what we want, we just don't wanna blow out huge parts of the shot. Now that you've got your strobe power dialed in, you can shoot similarly sized subjects at similar distances without really changing much. You might only be one click away on the power dial from your ideal setting if you even have to change it at all. The more you can stick to just shooting one size of subject, the less you're going to have to tweak during the dive. If you're not getting enough light on the subject, use these camera nerd tips. First, make sure that you're getting close enough and that you're actually bringing your strobe in close enough as well. Make sure you're filling the frame with the subject, or at least to the best that you can depending on your particular lens configuration, and either make sure you're zoomed in all the way, or you're just getting as close as that lens is able to focus. If your close-up subject still isn't getting enough light on it, increase your ISO up to 400 to make that scene just a little brighter. If you're shooting a larger subject and you'll be forced to be a little bit farther away, your strobe may not cut it at that distance. So if that's the case, open up your aperture back to f16 to collect a little bit more light on the sensor. This is actually better than increasing your ISO because it's not going to generate more noise in the image and that larger subject allows you to open up your aperture a little more since your depth of field becomes less critical than it is with small subjects. Once everything is looking great and you're really dialed in, just fire at will and bring up your shots to check for that critical focus periodically. Zoom in on your shots and get a good look at those key parts of the frame. Take multiple shots of your subject from multiple angles. Adjust your strobe position a bit. Keep critically reviewing and keep experimenting until you nail that shot. If you really want to get creative, add a snoot into the mix. So that's all there is to capturing great macro photos underwater with the Olympus EPL-10. These settings and techniques are all you need to create excellent macro images with the least amount of work involved. So say goodbye to your automatic shooting modes and welcome to the manual side. It's actually pretty dang easy when you break it all down. We can simply preset the on the boat settings so that the only things we actually have to manage in the water are our focus and our flash power. When shooting macro critters at short distances, there's really only a narrow range of flash powers you'd actually have to adjust, 
so the changes you need to deal with on the dive are minimal, if even required at all. You can download these custom settings as a little cheat sheet at the link in the description, and be sure to explore all the other videos, reviews, articles, and the world's largest inventory of underwater photo and video gear at backscatter.com. Your purchases from Backscatter and our worldwide network of authorized dealers and photo centers always include free lifetime tech support, and it helps us keep making more of these videos. We dive, shoot, and service everything we sell, and we're always happy to help when you need it. I'm Robin from Backscatter signing off, and may your next dive be macro-tastic. <laughs>